Zoom. Good morning, uh, dear uh, people. This is Trinity Lutheran Church, uh, Sunday morning Bible study, and some of you are watching as it begins on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. And uh, we are studying a theme called expectations, expectations. So that we can get started. We just want to make sure that our video is working. Pardon me while I get everything working here. their expectations. Eli's expectations, we're going to find out this morning, are unfulfilled. The second thing is that the Lord's expectations are unfortunately also unfulfilled in Eli's family. The expectations. He's all wet. His pants are all wet. Can't sit down. And finally, the Lord's expectations for Samuel, if we get that far. You know how things are in this Bible class, and many of you have been studying together for some time. So the recording is going because I see that little red spot there in the middle, and that gives me the assurance okay, okay. that something is Did going to be bring a towel to sit on? Your pants are all wet. All right. Uh, let's get started then with the Lord's expectations, and I want to review so that we kind of catch up to where we have been. You might recall from last week when we studied 1 Samuel chapter 2 that Eli's two sons have failed to meet their father's expectations. Now we're going to see that there are consequences. There are grave consequences. And I mean that in both, both senses of the word grave for their failure. You know, um, this is not a this is not an enjoyable thing for us to do, to study the judgment of God. But this morning, I want you to reflect upon the judgment of God and realize that there are, there is an accounting. There is an accounting for our sins. Someone must pay. I have a question for you, dear class. I'm going to involve you right away. What happens in those times when the children refuse to change after they have been corrected and disciplined in the biblical way? What happens? What can happen? Anyone? Just jump in. Everybody, you don't have to raise your hand. Just, just talk. I was going to say, I think their, their whole life can uh, be affected by um, something that maybe wasn't corrected as a young child. You know, um, honesty as far as, um, you know, maybe minor stealing or lying. Um, they continue to think that that's okay as they get older and it becomes greater and it becomes really difficult when they maybe get a job or have a family or try to, you know, get married and have a relationship. So, uh-huh, uh-huh. You mentioned lying. Uh, when lying is allowed to go uncorrected, almost unnoticed, the child learns it's okay. Right? Correct. When they continue that same behavior, then they, um, and they, they refuse to change, it's, uh, it's hard on the rest of the family, too because they can continue to see the, um, the person not grow, but uh, continue to sink into whatever their problem is and, and not move forward. That's right. Anybody else? What happens when, when there is no change in the deportment? Remember that record on your report card? On the back page after you had your grades for your subjects, then they had a little script for each part of the school year, and then it said uh, deportment grade. <laughs> I didn't do too well in deportment uh, always. I'm smiling because it's a pleasant memory now that I was corrected. Were you corrected by your parents? Most Anytime. definitely. 
with the paddle and with the hand. <laughs> okay. Or the withdrawal of privileges. No, I hear the parents take away screen time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That might be a good idea. I have another question for you. These sons refuse to repent after Eli says, what I hear about you is not good. What do you think of uh, Eli's challenge to Hophni and Phineas? Well, he's maybe he's hoping that um, since now so many people are talking about him, that um, they will realize that they are not doing things in secret, that everything is out there for everyone to hear and see, and hopefully he's trying to to shame them, maybe, into changing. Yeah, shame is a big thing. Um, it only goes so far, and when there is no repentance, and uh, we're going to talk a minute about what, is, what has happened to Eli's sons, that they brought this upon themselves. Anyone else, what happens when they refuse to repent? Yes, I do. Go ahead. We have more time for your discussion today. Well, they, they continued the behavior, especially with the sacrifices. And I think they did it to the point where they thought it was okay. It's like many behaviors in today's world where- I appreciate it so much. Where we I, don't I, obey- I um, was fearing that an, uh, the rainstorm might really drop it, you know? Where we don't obey rules and regulations. And pretty soon we think what we're doing becomes the norm. And they may have started to think that what they were doing with the sacrifices was the normal thing to do, um, that it became okay because if it no had one, been corrected. Yeah, if it remains uncorrected, okay. Well, that's what happens and it's, it's true of, you know, we're looking at something that is recorded 3,000 years ago, but it is still true so that uncorrected behavior tends to repeat. Mm -hmm. All right. The son's willful disobedience and evil, and it is evil in the Lord's sight. It showed that their hearts were set against the Lord. This is a terrible thing. They had hardened their hearts. And that means sin without any intent to repent. I'm not changing. It is a stubbornness. A stubbornness against the Lord. Not just against Eli. You see, they did sin against their father. Okay. Fourth commandment. But they did, in the greatest sense, sin against the Lord. So let's talk about hardens, the hardening of hearts. It's not something that can be cured by a cardiologist. Have you heard of this term, hardening of the heart? Quite frequently in the Old Testament. That's right. Psalm 32, verses 8 and 9. Um, we have two or three of you that enjoy reading, and I invite you to do that. Just jump in and whoever goes first. I'll read this when it doesn't have any big words to have to read. <laughs> Psalm 32, 8 and 9. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. You see what the Lord is saying and doing here? The Lord is a revealer. He does not forever hide behind a curtain and say, guess what I'm like. He reveals himself, something I've said to you many times in the past. He said, I will instruct you. The Lord is a teacher. I will teach you in the way you should go. He doesn't leave it to uh, sociologists and psychologists and uh, parents who might know better and might not know better because they also needed instruction. They needed to be taught when they were growing up and they still need, you and I still, I think you'll admit, still need to be taught. Some of you are here because you want to be taught. I will counsel you with my loving eye. 
you see that the Lord's attitude toward us as our Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, he says, I'm going to counsel you with my loving eye on you. You see that? Now, then he says, do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding. You're going to have, have to put a bit and bridle in their mouth. Or they won't come to you. They won't turn right or left. They won't obey you. They have to have a little bit of um, uh, coaxing to go right or left or stop. Whoa. Otherwise, those animals can be very stubborn. And you know the expression, stubborn as a? Mule. Mule. Okay. So you see what God is saying and doing here? Now, Psalm 32 is a well-known psalm in which David expresses his prayer that the Lord will forgive him. Blessed are they whose sin is forgiven, whose iniquities have been pardoned. Well, we'll not go into a study of the psalm this morning, but I wanted you to know the, the context. Psalm 95, verse 8, would someone read that? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. There's a, there's a part of us called the will. And it, 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 the seat of our will is in our hearts, not our intellect, our intellect. So he is not talking to our minds when he says that. He is talking to our will. When I teach you the way you should go, Psalm 95 is primarily... Uh, a psalm of praise, and it's in the it's the it's the uh, song that we sing at the beginning of Matins. Uh, that's another long story. I'm not taking that tangent this morning, class. <laughs> He's speaking to our wills. Don't harden your hearts when I talk to you. When I teach you, when you had a four-year-old or a seven-year-old, and you set them down, and you said, "Now." Now look at me. Look at my eyes. I want to talk to you. <laughs> Don't put up your disobedience against me like you did. Okay? And the child obediently, I hope, hangs his or her head. Don't harden your hearts against me. That can happen. Something more on the hardening of the heart. A very unusual um, thing to bring in here, but you'll see why I ask us to read Ephesians 4. Someone read it, please. They, the unbelieving Gentiles, are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. All right. Now, first you have a group of people that are called um, they, because you have to read the context to know that Paul is writing about the unbelieving Gentiles, not the unbelieving Jews, and certainly not anybody who is believing, not nobody with faith. And he tells us that they are darkened in their understanding and they're separated from the life of God. Why is that so? There's ignorance in them. Why do they have ignorance? Because they have hardened their hearts. When the Lord corrected them, they went and did it anyway. Now, verse 19 refers to some people that we have been to a couple of uh, men that we just have been studying. You see the connection between this and Eli's sons? What's the connection? Having lost all sensitivity. Well, they, they don't seem to care anymore that uh, what they're doing is evil and wrong. Uh, uh, sinning with the ladies there outside the church yeah. And um, just doing whatever they want to do, and out of their greed too, with uh, taking the um, the sacrifices, taking the best parts, and such as that. 
Okay. I think they I think they have an attitude of they know better than God what has what they should be doing and not what God wants them to be doing. Uh, they want to be in control. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I want what I want, and I don't care what God says. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then Mark eight, and you're going to wonder why I brought this passage in here. Why are you talking? about having no bread, Jesus is asking his disciples, do you not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? Here's the context. They've gotten into the boat to cross over the Sea of Galilee together. And the disciples have only brought with them uh, some cakes. No, not chocolate cakes. The cakes that they bake on the fire you know, of, of, of bread and oil and so forth. Well, he has said to them, beware of the, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. Now, the leaven of the Pharisees is, is hardened hearts and, and no gospel and refusal to bow to God's law and making up laws for themselves full of their own self-importance and self-righteousness. Beware of that leaven. But the disciples say, oh, we didn't bring any bread with us, did we? They're talking amongst themselves. And Jesus says, why are you talking about bread? Don't you understand? I wasn't talking about literal bread but the leaven that comes about when the Pharisees and the rulers of this world uh, get their way, and it's not the Lord's way. Are your hearts hardened? He wants them to look into their own hearts. Now, if you read the parallel account in Matthew chapter 16, you're going to find out that then they did understand. So their hearts did not remain hardened, or perhaps they weren't hardened at all. Do you have questions on, on those passages before we get it on? on? I've got my mind on a lot of things here, and I see it's 1028. All right. We'll continue this sub-theme of God's judgment against Eli's sons. And here's the question, we're go here's the passage, I'm sorry, that we're going to repeat over uh, several times here in the next few minutes. Someone read 1 Samuel 2.25. But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now I have a reason for underlining that in, in double red lines. This is red blood serious. I think that there are many Christians in the world today who do not know how much God hates sin. They believe in Jesus. They believe that he died for their sins. But they don't realize what it cost Jesus to be crucified. So the gospel to them is, is, is true, and they believe it, but they don't know how much the Lord is against the behavior that they continue without repentance. Or, come on Sunday, get forgiven, go back to your life. As though it was a shot that you had to have once a week, keep you alive. There is gospel. And we dare never forget to preach the gospel and to teach it into people's hearts. You know what, Pastor Larson? Christine here. Uh, I think we're not putting into account here temptation. Uh, constant temptation. When you leave... Go on. I mean, constant temptation, like these boys or whatever. Uh, not the boys, really, but, but to the person who... Like you say, goes to church and repents and then goes out. And the temptation of the world gets to them. Yes. 
Yes, it does. The devil, the world, and our flesh are the unholy three. Sometimes it's hard to separate which of the three are ganging up on us. Sometimes uh, it's more than one of them. The world, as you said, our flesh, and then the, the temptations of Satan. He knows. So here's the question. How are we to understand? And this is a this is a deep question. I want us to puzzle over this long enough so that our minds don't gloss over it and then just run on. What do we mean? How are, to we, uh, how are we to understand it was the will of the Lord to put them to death? I thought the Lord wanted us to live, to live abundantly, to enjoy life. Well, he sees, I think, that they are they just don't want to turn from the way that they have uh, to the people they have become. They want to do that. They, they don't have anything left in them that is part of the Lord. So he doesn't want them anymore. I think he's making an example of them. He is. And Chris, you bring to mind the passage in the New Testament that whatsoever things were written aforetimes were written for our learning and that, I, that um, phrase it gets into the prayer that i read earlier i'm sitting here wondering i don't know if i'm off the path here in this thinking but you know they they treated the sacrifices um not correctly in the way they were done which were the sacrifices to the Lord in the Old Testament. And um, it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. That's almost a prophecy of the fact that Christ is going to be put to death for their sins. And here he is sacrificing these young men also, as I think as it has been already said, as an example. Um, I don't know if it is a prophecy uh, to some extent or not. It's the... It's the will of the Lord to punish them with death. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. And he's, 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 he's calling them accountable for their actions, which is what he wants us to always be accountable for our actions. And we know in today's world what is happening because people are not taking responsibility for their own actions. Okay. I need to question this again, because, mm -hmm. yes, you know, when someone dies, we say, well, it's the will of the Lord. Now, here we're saying they died because they sinned, but a lot of these people that died had no way of doing anything against the Lord. They just died. Yeah, I won't take the second case because it's too general, but this specific case that we're referring to, that their sin has earned death. Okay. And everyone dies and you'd say, well, there's nothing more here. No, they earned eternal death because they refused to repent. Mm -hmm. When we see the word death in the Bible, we always have to try to figure out from the context what, what death we're talking about. It's not always easy. But okay. here, they will die the second death. Until they die, they're still the opportunity but mm -hmm. remember the hardened hearts. Yeah. Let me go on, and I think we're going to pick up more on this. Now, for some reason, uh, well, I don't know why this happens. And I'll say, pardon me, PowerPoint slide, share, there. The will of the Lord in this verse is his consequent will, that which followed not his antecedent will, the will that preceded their evil. Mm. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Mm. As a consequence of your refusal to repent, as a consequence of your hardened hearts, mm. I have determined that I will put you to death, says the Lord. It's not his antecedent will. It's not that he picked them out before eternity, uh, uh, before the world began, it's not that he picked them out when they were born, is that they're going to die. God reacts to people 
in ways that are justified. I'm going to ask you that question, but I've already answered it, haven't I? Does God have, okay, I, I'm anticipating the question that I know that I wrote. So it's difficult for me to keep them all in order. Do you understand the difference between consequent will and antecedent will? Not entirely, Pastor. Yeah, yeah. This word, this prefix, ante, A-N-T-E, is that yes. word that before, before the event. And the consequent will is, as you can say it in the sentence, it follows as a consequence. God did not determine on anyone. He did not pick out some to be damned contrary to Calvin's teaching. He picked us all out to live. So he is reacting to their refusal as a consequence. Now maybe you know, even, they, they had the free will to, to have behaved. They had the free will to sin. We are, we are born with that unmistakable quality. Pardon me. Um, to sin. So I can go on and say a few things more. The Lord's will to put them to death was based on his perfect foreknowledge that they would persist in sin without repentance and harden their hearts. He knew with perfectness, and God does not, not know anything, he knows everything. And he knows that they will persist in sin and they will never repent and they will they have hardened their hearts and they will never soften their hearts they will never come to him so because of that it was the lord's will to put them to death and we'll see how that happens does that help clear it up i want to say a few things more the sentence again, it was the will of the Lord to put them to death in 1 Samuel 2.25. And again, this is not predetermined, but consequential. God's foreknowledge does not cause the outcome. Does that sentence bother you? Well, that kind of says he knows what's going to happen, but he lets us run the course out. Would that be... God does not jump into our life no, it's and our tear us apart and mm -hmm. reassemble the parts so that we're, uh, we're if, if we hardened our hearts, he lets us go. And that's a terrible thing. For finally, God says, I, I can't do anything with you. You've probably known some parents who have said about their children in a, in a sorrowful way, I just, I just can't do anything with them anymore. Please don't volunteer if you've had that problem. I, we'll do that privately if you want to talk about that someday, but not, not here. And if they're still alive, there's still there's still hope. My my foreknowledge is incomplete, and so is yours. Please understand that. A person is always free to sin, and may be open by God's grace to repent and receive forgiveness. And that's why we want people in contact with the Word of God. We want them to know what is true and to believe that the Lord hates their sin and still loves them. So he wants them to be open. And it is the grace of God that opens us. Don't get anything in your mind that says, well, if I try hard enough to get open to God's grace, maybe he will come. No, he has already come, and he has given us the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no greater grace than the grace that Jesus earned for us. Grace is the unmerited love and forgiveness of God. Okay? No pharisaical ideas in here. I didn't earn his grace. I can't get more of it. What I have is already complete. You understand? This is full and complete forgiveness that comes 
to people who say, I'm sorry, Lord, I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what I, I have done and by what I have left undone. And there's a pile of stuff there in that pile. Oh man, there's just a pile of things I have left undone. Lord, for the sake of Jesus, forgive me. That's your prayer and my prayer. However, these two sons of Eli had hardened their hearts against the Lord and they had sinned without repentance because the Lord knew they would never repent. His will was to put them to death. That's a summary statement. All right. Well, let's go on and see if we can apply it. I have four questions to apply this teaching in our day. So let's take this hypothetical set of parents are a pastor who attempt correction and rebuke of uh, whatever sinners we're talking about. And some of them, unfortunately, refuse to repent, but instead harden their hearts. Is that true? Is that something that happens in our day? Yes. Do the law authorities uh, uh, attempt correction? Oh, man. Sometimes yeah. don't go there. <laughs> oh, oh, we're just we're just so. Um, turn your TV off. Uh, attempt of correction or let it go. When, when the government, whatever, whatever government there is in any stage of history, in any uh, part of history, does not bring correction, and it is. Romans 13 uh, it is the requirement that the Lord has laid upon government to, to, to punish those who sin and to praise those who do right. Yeah. So when they don't, when they don't rebuke sin, they teach this terrible untruth that is okay. To lie, steal, cheat, commit adultery and all the rest, not to mention the first three. The government is not in the first three commandments. And until it says you can't worship, and that's another story. So there's this refusal to repent. God has determined that those who refuse to repent and thereby reject his free offer of forgiveness have earned death. We mentioned this before. If God hands me the solution to my sin, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I say, I don't want it, I don't need it, I'm not a sinner, or I'm a sinner, but that can't help me, then what's God going to do? There is no other rescue. There is no other rescue. There is no other name given among heaven by which we must be saved. All right? There is one mediator between God and man, and that's that man, Christ Jesus. On the other hand, application number three, the, the will of the Lord is always, and, and listen to this with your hearts, please. Listen to this and, and apply it to those you love. I'm serious, gang. It is the will of the Lord always first to save and to warn he saves us by warning us. Don't go there. It's his will, his loving will to rescue us. How many times uh, I've been rescued? How many times you, you have been rescued? And uncountable times that the Lord has forgiven us. That's the will of the Lord to save, to warn, to rescue, and to forgive. What's the passage from Ezekiel 18.32? Do you know this? Yeah, we can't say it together because of the uh, delay. Would someone therefore read Ezekiel 18.32? On the other hand, the will of the Lord is always first to save, to warn, to rescue, and to forgive. For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. Turn is the word for repentance there. And now uh, something personal that I'm asking you not to bring up here, 
because I don't want you to mention names or relationships, but I want you to think for a minute, and I'm serious about this. It's something to pray about. Think about someone you have known who appeared to have demonstrated a hardened heart against the Lord. And the only thing I can suggest to you after you have said what the Lord has said, if you have had that opportunity, is to pray for them and ask God to intervene. Because as a pastor, I have always seen instances where God intervenes with some event or some illness or some tragedy or, or something happens in the person's life to cause them at least for a few moments to look up. And when they look up, uh, a prayer like, oh God, help me, I don't know what to do. When they look up, there's a, there's a chance for God to get his word in edgewise. And then sometimes it's, it doesn't last very long. I could tell you stories. There are consequences for sin. And um, this is a long passage. So there are no hard words in it. Uh, someone take a deep breath and read these three verses. Okay, I'll read it. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in bondage to Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose them from all the tribes of Israel to be my priests, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to carry an uh, ephod before me? Did I not give to the house of your father all the fire offerings of the sons of Israel? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons above me? and making yourself fat with the choices of every offering of my people, Israel. Now look at the words that I've underlined. Mm -hmm. The first thing that you see in verse 27, 28, didn't I reveal myself? Didn't I choose those who would be priests? Didn't I give to those priests, the house of your father, that's Aaron, and all who descended from him, okay? Didn't I give to them all the offerings that came? They were supposed to first put them on the fire and burn those to me, and then they could help themselves. This is his way of feeding them. The Lord wants the offering first. It's his but they didn't do that. And now he has this against Eli. The next thing I underlined was, honor your sons above me. What is that? Having someone greater than God, he's honoring his sons instead of God. You know a commandment that forbids that? <laughs> First commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Yeah, before, above, instead of any any uh, preposition you use there applies. I know this happens. I know this happens to parents when, well, let's take a real simple example. I remember when my, what, how old was he? Um, I'd have to do the math, but um, he wasn't 10 yet. And he, we got to church for worship and he folded his arms against his chest and he said, I'm not going to church. <laughs> and I was in training to be a pastor and it really bothered me that my son, a future, if I can use the word priest, in quotes, son, um, wasn't going to church. What was I going to do? Well, it's a long story, and I won't finish it today, 
but it was really bothering me. And if I had honored him above me and said, okay, we're not going to church today. Well, that would be an instance in which the parent gives in to the will of the child, which is against the will of the Lord. You see what I'm talking about? Can you remember a time uh, in your life when, uh, when you had children where something like that happened? Many times. <laughs> yeah. Uh, children don't always want to do what they ought to do. Well, I have to remember that that clicker has many purposes, and um, I have to be careful. So the Lord is going to bring charges, and this is what the Lord had against Eli and his sons. I gave you your house. I gave your house, and the word house is not a building, you understand, and it's not the church. I gave your house, meaning the lineage from Aaron and his sons and their sons' sons, and all the way down to you over the past few hundred years, the gift of the priesthood. And I was giving to you when I gave you that, the prestige and the honor and the ability to serve me in this special way. Remember, I keep saying to you, based on the descriptions of the priesthood in the Old Testament, is that this was not a job. There are qualifications and there are requirements and those who are chosen for it by God's call into the ministry. Wow. I gave your house, and I gave you the sacrifices that come to my altar. All the fiery off offerings were yours to have. I, I don't think any of you thought that, that somehow the Lord consumed them as, as a human being consumes meat. I don't think you ever thought that. And maybe you wondered when you were much younger, what happened to all the, the sacrifices? What do they do with them? The priests and the Levites ate them. And when I see all the sacrifices that came, I, there must have been a great uh, feast. You sought instead to gain personally from your service you fattened yourselves of the choicest parts of every offering. Uh, you know that they weren't supposed to eat the fat that was supposed to be burned. Now, you fattened yourselves. If you, if you leafed ahead in your Bibles, which you probably haven't done to, for Samuel 4, 18. When Eli died, and I'll just tell you now how he dies, that the ark of the Lord has been stolen by the Philistines, Philistines. And his sons have died. And he fell over and, and died. He broke his neck or something. Um, and the reason he did so is he was so heavy when he fell. Uh, he died just from the fall. He was old and heavy from all that eating. You see, it wasn't just his sons. You fattened yourselves, and so the Lord was including Eli in the sin. This is the first time that has come to our minds here. So the Lord brought charges, and this is what the Lord had against Eli and his sons. You scorn my sacrifices, you scorn my offerings, and you honor your sons above me. That's the charge. It's, that's the indictment. And they're going to be convicted, not in a court of law, but in God's court. I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. He knew better. He let them go. And dear parents, your fathers, listen to that with your hearts. So I ask you, what should Eli have done? Mm.
I guess first he should have gotten himself in order. He had to have known because of the sacrifices that were coming to him that it was more than he was owed. Yes, that's right. You know, what should he have done? He should have done, taken his sons away from the power to do those things. How so? How would he do that? Well, he, he has the power to stop them. He can, you know, say, I'm not going to let you do that. I'm going to appoint someone else in your place. Who is the high priest at that moment in time? He is. That's right. But he did not restrain them. He did not stop them. He did right. not remove them from office. Now our hour is up, dear children of God. I'm going to uh, pray that the Lord will lay this on our hearts. Lord God, you have gathered us together for your purposes and you have warned us. Grant it, Lord. Grant that uh, that in, in the time that we have on this earth, that you will continue to warn us and love us and correct us and lead us. And also bring us to a point where we are courageous enough to lead others to you so that they will be warned and, and, and not fall into the hardening of hearts and let their sin come over them. Pray that you will bless our, our study and keep your word going. Let the gospel of Jesus continuously and daily and uh, come to our hearts and offer us the forgiveness that he has earned for us. He suffered and we need not suffer eternal death. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God be with you till we meet again. Dear people uh, who are watching on Sunday and, and thereafter, this is the Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. I'm Pastor Larson. We have this every Sunday at 10 o'clock. We also have worship either in person with uh, masks and social uh, distancing at 8.30 and 10.30. Oh, is it? Please uh, please join us there uh, at Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach or watch online because it is broadcast live at the same time, 8.30 and 10.30.